Welcome everybody. This is the Attracting Birds to Your Winter Garden webinar. Uh, my name is Brittany Like. I won't be presenting, but I'll be helping uh, to moderate the questions and invite people whenever they get into the webinar. I'm the program coordinator for Detroit Audubon, but I'm thrilled to have Roseanne here. Uh, join us, Roseanne, if you want to go ahead and start. Sure. Um, I guess I'd like to just say that my um, love of birds began when I was a teenager and I had a very influential uh, biology teacher who uh, taught me to appreciate birds, who took us on field trips, and that's when my love of birds began. And then years later, I noticed that there were less and less birds. And so my uh, focus towards turning uh, to gardening for birds as, as opposed to just feeding them the way that my business does with, you know, seed and suet, things like that, um, became very important to me. I decided that habitat was something that I needed to work on uh, very much. And so I've taken my yard in Gross Point Woods, which is, you know, not very big. I think my lot is 75 by 150 feet and most of it is native plants. There's very little lawn. I have attracted 139 species of birds uh, as since I started keeping track. I'm just waiting for that 140. Um, so I hope to be able to show you some ways that you can make your yard be more bird friendly as, uh, as you plan going forward. All right, let's see if this works with my um, presentation here. Oops. How, why am I not able to... Oh, there we go. So uh, I decided to start with chickadees because they're absolutely, um, they're just so heartwarming to see them. They come all through the years. And one of the interesting things about chickadees in winter is that they increase the size of their hippocampus, which is part of their brain. That's the memory part of the brain that allows them to remember where they have put all of their seeds uh, that they've stashed away. Um, and, and so that is, to me, is just an amazing fact about what a bird can accomplish. And of course, as shown in this picture, they have increased the amount of feathers that they have between summertime and wintertime, and that helps them with insulation. Uh, birds use 75% of their fat reserves to survive long winter nights. So wanting to help them in some way is certainly commendable. And of course, your yard can be a place of refuge for the resident birds that don't migrate, as well as those winter visitors that migrate to our area from further north. So what's the birds that we can attract to our yard for those of you that may be not familiar with all of them? A resident bird is a bird that doesn't leave. They are here all year round, and that includes Northern Cardinals. This is a female, black-capped chickadees, um, and this guide, you, you look at them with a seed like this inside of their beak, and, and it's kind of amazing to know that they're going to be able to take that seed and make a meal out of it. What they do, what chickadees do, is they will fly away, hold that seed between their feet on a branch, and then peck the outer shell out in order to get to the shell that's inside of that, or to the seed that's inside of that. Tufted titmice are a cousin of black-capped chickadees. And although we don't have them in as great a numbers as they do in the Southern United States, um, they're just a wonderful little addition to this area and very much uh, love oak trees. So that's a good plus for if you have the ability to have oak trees in your area. I love this picture because it shows both the hairy woodpecker and downy woodpecker. And we do get a lot of questions about how do I tell the difference? So a little bit of bird ID here is on the right hand side, you see the downy woodpecker, that really teeny dinky, which starts with a D, beak, that is the same uh, letter as downy. So remember, downy has a dinky beak. It's really small. Harry has a huge beak. It's about the same length from the, from the front to back as is the, the head from the front to back. So that's a good way to tell them apart, just the overall size. And although it doesn't show in this pic picture, the 
outer tail feathers of a downy woodpecker also have dots. So those are a couple different Ds that you can remember. And both of them are resident birds. They do not migrate away. Red-bellied woodpeckers. This is a bird from the Southern United States that really has expanded its range and spends uh, the year here. Um, it has expanded because there is more food sources and it is a very uh, successful bird with uh, finding the foods that it needs in order to be able to stay as a resident throughout the year. Don't you just love white-breasted nuthatches? This guy hangs upside down and nuthatch comes from the British word nuthacker. That's what they called them when they came over here and watch these birds putting seeds into parts of the trees and then hacking away at them in order to get the shell off of them. And they do serve a great purpose because they go upside down on trees and find all of the insects and, uh, and invertebrates that they can eat that the birds that travel right side up may forget. American goldfinch. I love this picture from um, one of my sales associates. She took this picture and what it shows is the molting of goldfinch. So on the left, you still see that that bird has some yellow left in it. On the right, you see far less. And so it's kind of like comparing uh, bright yellow mustard compared to brown mustard. This time of year, the goldfinch are losing their coloration, the males, so they're gonna look like the bird on the right. But if you look at their wing pattern, it's black with the white wing bars. So that's one of the tells when you see that bird that lets you know that you do have goldfinch. Housefinch is a resident bird, but What's different about it is that it was basically brought to the side of the country uh, to Long Island to be sold as a pet. And what happened is that the person who was selling it was busted and they had to let go of all of these birds. And they did, and out of a, like maybe a dozen or two, these birds bred and have now spread across the Eastern part of the United States to the Rocky Mountains. They're not, a bird that deals with high elevations. So they don't necessarily go up and over the Rocky Mountains. And they originally came from California. So now we have our own uh, Eastern subspecies of this particular bird. Uh, if you look at this bird in comparison to purple finch, which we'll look at next, they have red as an eyebrow as opposed to uh, what a purple finch has, and they also have streaking all along the breast. Here's little Carolina wrens, another bird that's basically a southern bird like red-bellied woodpeckers, but they're, they have expanded their range because they are so uh, successful in finding foods. And then of course, eastern screech owl. Isn't this an amazing camouflage picture? I Somebody needs to turn this into a... Uh, puzzle. I think that would be great, but a, definitely a resident. They don't have to migrate away as long as they have the right habitat to support them. Now, then we have partial migrants. American robins are one of those. The reason that they move is because of food source. So most of them are going to go south, but because they can find some foods here in the form of berries, and they have acclimated to be using feeders, they can stay for the winter time. If they do, they end up with choice habitat to offer to the females. And their cousins, the Eastern bluebirds are also partial migrants. Many will stay through the winter time, but a lot of them will leave and go south for better food sources. And blue jays, have you noticed how many blue jays are going through? You get a lot of blue jays that are passing over. I know that the uh, hawk watches keep track of these. One day, I think they had like over 3000 that were moving. This is based upon the food source that's uh, north of us in Ontario. And so these birds know that the food source isn't great and they start to move through in great numbers and settle down wherever they do see a good food source. Red-breasted nuthatches are another one that is a partial migrant. And sometimes we get these little pockets where they'll stay and they'll nest, but by and large, they really are more of a winter visitor for us. Pine siskin is another one. And so I love this bird from the standpoint that it's so unusual 
but it hangs out with the goldfinches. And if you look at it, it's completely different. Very pointy bill, streaked all over, yellow in the wing, but, but pretty much exactly the same size. And they are a bird that comes to us in eruptions. And so again, they, they look at what the seed crop is like in Ontario. And if it's not good, they've decided to come down to this area. Here's that purple finch. Now notice there's no streaking in the breast like the house finch. You've got a lot more of a deep purple as opposed to a, a strawberry that's in the house finch. And you've got that very defined uh, eye line that's got the purple in it, which when you look at the female, you can see that as well. And she's showing you one of the reasons that, that they come down for seeds. Um, purple finch also have a straighter bill at the top than a house finch does. So when you're trying to identify who's at your feeder, if you look at the purple finch, you can see that that's a, um, one of the tells that can help you identify this bird. And of course, we've all had a lot of reports of dark-eyed juncos lately. They spend winter north of us, or so, I'm sorry, spring and summer north of us breeding, and then they come to us during winter. That seems so strange, but this is as far as they need to go in order to be able to find a food source. And they will continue going further south. Usually what we see are the males, the females do go further south. I'm not sure what trick they have going on there, but there's something that they know about why they wanna travel further. Maybe it's because the males wanna get back on their nesting territory sooner than the females do. And then as we were talking about white-throated sparrows, a lot of them this time of year, it's just wonderful to hear them. You can hear their little practice songs right now. Um, they don't do a whole song. They, they're kind of all learning how to do this. And um, look on the ground for true sparrows, which the junco and the white-throated sparrows are. So now that we've looked at resident birds, migratory birds, birds that come to us in eruption. What do all these birds need in the winter? Basically, they're looking for food. Food for these birds are seeds, their insects, and their berries. And that gives them the protein and fat that they need. Of course, every living organism needs water, so they need it for drinking. Birds also need it for keeping their feathers in top flight and insulating condition. They're coming to us for habitat. They're looking for native plants that gives them the best leg up when it comes to surviving the winter. Open areas I think is important. Uh, one of the things that I've done in my yard is I've kept open areas so that I can view the birds like the white crowned sparrow or the white crowned and the white throated sparrows, towhees. They like to kick around where there is uh, a lot of leaf, air, leaf litter that's in that area so I could probably put more plants there, but I wanna be able to see those open areas. And if I don't have open areas, I'm not gonna be a good habitat for those birds. And that's where I literally take all my leaves. So what I'm doing after this is I'm getting out there with a rake and I'm raking my leaves, but instead of taking them to the curb, I'm putting them in these open areas under my cedars. So these birds have something um, for now and for any time that it's open when there's not uh, you know, ice or snow that's covering everything. And then another thing that's really important are snags for perching. The definition of a snag is a branch that's basically out in the open. And I'll show you some pictures of that. And birds need that for a number of reasons. And then of course, shelter we need to provide. Evergreens is one of your best bets for birds, like cardinals, finches, but roosting cavities are very important for the birds that would normally use a cavity like a, a black capped chickadee or all the different woodpeckers are gonna be looking for cavities that they can go into for the night. That's where they spend the night. So seeds from plants it is what birds are seeking naturally. This is a pine siskin that's gonna come and work on all of these cones. And that's one of the reasons why they come to an area. What's interesting about birds is that they have sight that allows them to know when a seed is ripe. How awesome is that? So if you don't see them at your purple cone flower that you picked up and then all of a sudden they're there, they can tell by the ultraviolet light in that seed that it's ready to eat. 
and they'll visit you when the plant is ready. This is a goldfinch that's seeding, feeding on a cedar tree. So when you're thinking about what you should do in your yard, how you can add habitat, think about evergreens. They're very important. Then of course you wanna leave your flowering plants up until spring. Lots of people are out there right now saying, oh, I gotta do fall cleanup. Not such a great idea if you're wanting to create a bird habitat. Although we may look at a purple coneflower and say, this doesn't look so good anymore. It is a feast for these birds. So you leave them up until spring. And the rule of thumb is when we have a week of 50 degree temperatures at night in the spring, that's when you can start to take these things down. That's also when leaf litter uh, is that's holding its invertebrates and other foods is ready to for all of those critters to be able to leave. Now, this is one thing that I had a good time watching in my yard. I've got goldenrod planted and it is an important food for white-throated sparrows and all of the other sparrows. I actually had a chance to watch the white-throated sparrows jump on these stalks of goldenrod and bring them down closer to the ground so they could shake the seeds off and then be able to eat them. Now, oak trees are probably the um, master when it comes to providing food for birds. They provide acorns as well as more types of caterpillars than any other tree in our area. Over 500 species of butterflies and moths use oak trees as their host plant. We're all familiar with the, with the uh, relationship between monarch butterflies and milkweed. That happens between other things like our moths. And so using oak trees as their host plant provides a lot of source of food for these birds other than just the mast or the acorn that comes from the tree. Look at this picture. Can you believe that this rufous-sided towhee got this nut into his beak? I think he's probably wondering, now what do I do? Because it looks like it's too big for him to be able to handle. But I'm sure that something happened here that was a good thing. So speaking about feeding birds, of course, the tradition of feeding birds in winter is one that brings joy to us during our days. And I believe it's a critical connection for us to the out of doors when weather keeps us inside. How many of us like to sit inside with our hot cup of tea um, or later in the evening, maybe our you know warm cider or something like that in order to be able to watch the birds that are coming to our feeders. We can help birds by providing for them the things that maybe they can't find in nature. Maybe they're scarce because there's such a good population and there's not a lot of neighbors that are planting native. So what do they need? Um, seed comes, it, it provides for them oil in the form of lipids and sunflower seed is the number one seed that you can provide that will give them what they need the most. Sunflower either in the shell or out of the shell. Isn't this a wonderful picture of a northern flicker? More and more of them are staying during the winter because they do have a food supply. I'm seeing this in the Christmas bird counts that are being done. And um, this guy was a little bit too heavy for the setting on this feeder. It's a squirrel proof one. And so when he got on there, it kind of shut down the seed ports because we weren't really expecting him to show up at a feeder like this. So birds need in the winter more food to offset the calories that they are burning. They use up to 75% of their body fat every night when they go to shelter overnight and they wake up in the morning, 75% of what body fat they had is gone. Wouldn't that be a dream <laughs> to wake up the next day and have that much gone? These are pine siskins that are on a seed cylinder. And one of the ways that you can help birds is by providing a large amount of food in a concentrated area so that um, the birds have a steady source of food supply and you're not having to go out there all the time. That's one of the benefits of a seed cylinder. It gets eaten slower and um, less goes to the ground. 
So the dietary lipids uh, supply energy and they are the only dietary component that is deposited intact into the tissue of birds. I love this little picture of uh, chickadees. It just goes to show you how um, resourceful they are. They find that little peanut split, they go to a, a perch, they end up you know, pecking away at it and eating it. And chickadees are interesting from the standpoint that other birds follow them. They know how successful chickadees are. And so they will follow them in a group uh, and be able to um, benefit from that relationship. Okay, here's blue jays. I know some people have this concern about blue jays. Oh, they're mean, they're this, they're that. But there's a lot of really good things about blue jays and a lot of interesting facts. So they look to things like peanuts in order to be able to um, use them as a replacement for maybe the other mast that isn't there, the acorns, the beech nuts. And blue jays have the ability to put those seeds into what is called a gular pouch that's in their throat. And so they can stuff that with seeds. They can also carry in their beak. Then they will take acorns and they will try to stash them away so that other birds and squirrels and everybody can't find them. Well, what ends up happening, this guy's hiding them away. Um, what ends up happening is that uh, they don't remember where they put them all or they don't need them all. And so the next year you end up finding all kinds of little oak trees that have sprouted all over the place. And that's how the oak trees get spread across the Eastern United States. So what else can you do for birds in winter? Um, you can provide suet, which is a concentrated form of lipids. Uh, suet is beef fat from uh, cattle and it is formed into cake form. Uh, if you're looking for quality, what you wanna look for is something that has very little water in it. Um, many people will notice that there's certain suet that is less expensive than others, and that is because the water co uh, content in those suet cakes is higher, and so therefore it's going to shrink once you put it out. So the higher fat that you have and peanuts that are added are really good for the birds that are trying to make it through the winter. This is a pileated woodpecker, and as far as I know, I think the most that we've had in southeastern Detroit would be Farmington Hills. I've heard quite a few reports, Bloomfield Hills area. Um, these birds need a lot of dead wood. And so if you don't have that in the habitat of your community, then you may not get them uh, in the same numbers about, as other areas. So I have heard um, and even seen some myself at Kensington Metro Park. Yes. So that's a good place. Um, it's not guaranteed, but there's chances of seeing them in the winter time. Yeah, I believe that they nest there. Um, and because that's a, an area that's let to, to be very natural, you've got logs on the ground, you've got big standing dead wood, and that's what they're looking for. Their primary food source during nesting area during uh, you know spring and summer uh, is, is the insects, uh, the, the big boring beetles. Um, that they can find in the wood. Um, this is a great shot. I love this one. The hairy woodpecker is on the left. So we, we looked at the downy woodpecker and we thought, wow, he's pretty small compared to the hairy. Look at the comparison between that and the uh, pileated woodpecker. Here's another picture of the hairy. And I wanted to show this feeder just because I know we get so many questions about, oh, what can I do to to make it less easy for starlings or house sparrows. This is a good feeder for that. They can't seem to feed from it as easily as from other feeders because of all of the holes that they have to dig into. It's definitely meant for a clinging bird. So speaking of abnormalities, this is a brown creeper. Not necessarily a bird that you're gonna get coming to feeders all the time, but certainly a bird that you can get in your yard creeping along the branches, looking for insects. They use that beak to, to pry under the bark in order to find the insects that they need. And guess what? <laughs> Somebody got it coming to that exact same feeder because it simulates what bark is like so much with the suet inside of it. 
And suet basically is giving these birds the protein and the fat that they would normally find in insects, but it gives them that quick uh, hit of energy and then they're gonna leave and then they're still gonna go look for insects, but they've got something to tide them over. Another way of feeding birds in the winter is providing mealworms. I don't have a problem with live mealworms, handling them, putting them out. As some people don't like that. There's dried mealworms that are available too. In many areas, we have uh, bluebirds that will stay through the winter. And so providing mealworms is a good way to, to provide for them as well. So when it comes to feeding goldfinches, house finches, and purple finches, they will eat niger seed, also known as thistle. Um, but now we're noticing that shelled sunflower seed is very much preferred. These guys look like they're having uh, an argument over who should be eating what out of what port. But um, if you feed with sunflower seed out of the shell, you're gonna find that you're gonna attract, be able to attract these birds as well. And then I like this picture um, because it shows you that even though you're looking at these birds and maybe wondering, this is, is this a goldfinch? It's not bright yellow, but I'm not quite sure. You've got the black wings with the white wing bars that allow you to know that that's a goldfinch. Of course, the lower left is not. That's a pine cisk in there. And then as a side note, for those of you that choose to feed the birds with bird food as opposed to just plants, a weather guard is always a good idea. Look what happened to this feeder and thank goodness there was a weather guard on there. These birds get a chance to come to the feeder and still feed. You don't have to worry about the seed getting wet. So this Robin looks a little put out by the weather, doesn't he? Well, birds are equipped to make it through the winter because they grow more feathers and so they can fluff them out and use this in the same way that we use a down jacket. Um, it's capturing air pockets that is then going to be able to warm the bird. And robins, as a partial migrant, will eat any of the berries that you are planting that are native. Of course, native plants come, the fruit comes to uh, its edibility at a certain point in time, depending upon uh, the area that it is from. So if you plant something that's not from this area, that fruit isn't going to be the right fruit for any of the birds because it's not gonna become ripe at the right time. Um, and what's the advantage of Robin staying here and eating something during the winter and trying to make it through and you look at them and you feel so bad for them. It's like, oh, how's this bird gonna make it through the winter? Well, they're hedging their bets that if they stay and they find a food source, they are the first guys back on spring territory. And then they can offer that to a female in order to be able to um, have the best territory for breeding. Love this picture of a cedar waxwing eating um, juniper berry, another really important native plant that you can uh, offer in your yard. And look at this one with that tongue up. Great, a great bird to observe during winter. And cedar waxwings are one of those birds where during breeding season, spring, summer, they're catching insects in order to be able to feed them to their babies. And you can watch them on the edges of the uh, streams that we have in uh, the state and flying out and catching all those different insects to feed the babies. But then they become frugivores during the fall and the winter. Their diet completely goes uh, a different way. Love this picture of a pileated woodpecker eating poison ivy uh, berries. So they will eat what's natural out there. And we talked about leaf litter. Um, I'm a big fan of leaf litter. And this is a fox sparrow that uh, was feeding in someone's yard. And what sparrows do is they are more equipped to feed on the ground. They're not a perching bird like the little goldfinches are, purple finches are. They like to be on the ground and how they find what's in that um, leaf litter is by scratching back and forth. Look at this little guy. So they, they move their bodies back and forth in order to be able to dig to the invertebrates that are inside of the leaf litter. 
And again, remember, hopefully we don't have snow cover the entire winter. So these areas are important to create now for the birds. I love this image because it does remind us that in order to create a really good habitat for these birds, we want that leaf litter that has the hidden insects and larvae. We want the trees that have berries and nuts. We want the seed heads that are there for food. And if you live in an area where you can do it, keep some branch piles out and shrubbery for protection. If you're looking for some information as to how to choose native plants, there's a lot out there. These are two different sites that you can go to and you put in your zip code and they will give you an abundance of information that allows you to figure out what you might want in your yard, what's good, what are you missing? Are you looking for berry plants? They're gonna, they're gonna help you there. Are you looking for um, evergreens? They're gonna also give you that information. So what else did we talk about that birds need? Water. This would be a really not so easy way to get water, but I love this picture of the resourceful chickadee like we talked about, taking advantage of a dripping icicle. You can do a little bit uh, easier of a situation for birds by providing a heated bird bath. Um, I absolutely love mine. I've had this exact bath for years and years. Um, it's worked very well. Yes, you do need an outlet that allows you to plug it in, um, but it's worth it uh, because you get so many birds that you may not normally get if you're just offering um, bird food for them, whether it's natural or in a feeder. A pair of little goldfinches here coming to some water and a real prize, a Northern flicker. So, what else is it that birds need? They need snags. A sn the definition of a snag is a piece of dead wood that allows a bird to be able to sit on it, to observe what's around it. Um, I think that most of us probably have been cultured to think about dead wood as something that we need to get rid of, something that we should trim off. We, you know, What's the purpose of it? It doesn't look good. But from a standpoint of birds, if you go out and start to watch them and what they're doing, they're always on dead wood as a lookout place. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. And of course, um, they need it as a lookout spot for danger. Blue jays are great at this. So they will get on a, a branch, they'll look out, they'll check to see, are there cats, are there other predators, are there hawks? And then they can call out to the other birds to let them know that the, the coast is not clear. So they use uh, uh, snags in order to be able to look for that type of thing. And same thing with little birds. Little birds have a tendency to group in what's called a winter flock. And so this little red breasted nut hatch may be part of a winter flock that includes black capped chickadees, downy woodpecker, maybe some kinglets. Um, and they're all working together to feed. And he wants to see, hey, where'd my group go? And so he's gonna land on a little spot that's out in the open and also needs that little spot to be able to land when he's going from one place to the other. A little tufted titmouse that's also checking out the group. He would be part of that winter foraging uh, group that is going from one place to the other. So, so what else on, do birds, pardon? I was gonna say before you move on, something that I was thinking of that relates to the snags that um, I believe you probably saw in your store is you have those little attachments that go on those poles that you can actually put a dead branch into for birds to sit on on your natural bird's coat. Uh, well, there you go, Brittany. Thank you. I should probably have a picture of that. It's called a, a triple branch holder. And I have one on one of my feeders. So yes, it's, it's an attachment that goes on the pole. And then there's three different spots where you can add dead branches and then the birds are able to land and then they can end up coming to the feeders. It's like a waiting spot for them to be able to get to the feeders. Yeah, it's a good one. Um, in fact, I watched a female um, pileated woodpecker, you know, young from this year, 
land on one and she didn't quite know how to get to the to the suet feeder and so she kind of scooched over on that branch until she could reach over and feed from the suet feeder it was really cute to watch that um so what else do we need to give to birds in winter shelter is very important right we think about when we're in our house and it's storing outside and you know we think about how are these birds getting through this well Evergreens is a great way for most birds, uh, like cardinals, um, all the different finches, they're not you birds that use cavities, so they do need those evergreens. But then again, the nesting boxes, both um, the natural areas that they can go inside of and nest nesting boxes that we leave out, provide roosting places for birds. Woodpeckers do create their own winter roosting places. And then there's natural cavities that they, when they create them, we need to think about not getting rid of them, leaving them for birds as opposed to looking at a cavity and thinking it's something we need to trim away. My favorite story about birds in roosting in, in the evergreens is in my very little yard, I have two different rows of cedars that were here when I moved in 40 years ago. And one of them showed one of them was used by this long-eared owl as a roosting place. And who let me know that this bird was there? Blue jays calling and alarm and alarm calls, letting everybody know there's an owl, there's an owl. So I snuck underneath and I took a look, and there it was. A friend of mine took this picture. So this bird used the evergreens as a nesting spot. In another place, I had the same situation, but it was the chickadees that let me in on another bird that was using the evergreens as a roosting spot, and it was a boreal owl. I didn't have a picture that I could share. I do have pictures there, ju I just didn't get a chance to upload it, but amazing. What can you accomplish with a total of, I think I have three evergreens on the north and three evergreens on the east. And this is what I end up getting. It goes to show you to listen to the small birds because they're gonna let you know when there's something there worth grabbing your binoculars and your camera for in order to go take a look. So here's a natural cavity. Look how this Eastern screech owl blends in so easily. Most people would look at this snag with the hole in it and say, ah, I gotta cut that off. I encourage you not to do that because that is exactly what these birds are looking for. However, unless we can convince everybody in our neighborhood that this should be the norm, there may not be as many places for these birds as we would like them to have. So you can provide the alternative, which would be uh, a nesting box that is literally just meant for owls. This customer of ours was very lucky to get the Eastern screech owl coming to his. So woodpeckers create holes in dead wood. This is a red-bellied woodpecker. And when you see a hole on top of a hole like this, it's typically red-bellied woodpeckers. I'm not sure why they do that. It's another question that I get to ask when I get to bird heaven, you know, what, what is it with the condominium going here? Um, but these are, what woodpeckers do is every year, they create a new nest cavity. And so these older cavities are left for other birds to use. Great plan that mother nature has going. And so other little birds will use this, such as white-breasted nuthatch. Chickadees use the nesting holes from woodpeckers as their nesting holes because they don't typically excavate their own, although they will sometimes. So if you don't have a lot of dead wood, but you want to provide a place for birds, you can provide a roosting box for them. This is a little downy woodpecker male that is using a, a nesting box for the purpose of roosting overnight. And if you have bird houses in your yard already, this is the one that we sell at our store, most of the Wild Birds Unlimiteds, you can take the nesting material and instead of leaving the ventilation spot that's underneath the roof overhang open, you toss some insulation there to keep the colder winds out of there and it becomes an even better nesting spot for birds to be able to use as protection against the winter. 
Hi, thank you all for your interest in this program. And I hope that I've given you some ideas that can give you a chance to enjoy the birds this winter. Thank you, everybody. So we had a few questions earlier on in your presentation. I answered a few. Um, someone asked at one point what berries the cedar waxwing were eating. I had responded with that it was crabapple berries. There were also juniper berries as well, but they were wondering about the one without a list. Um, someone else asked, where can they buy native junipers? I think that both um, wild type in Mason, Michigan and Michigan Eastern Plants in Langsburg also sells those. Okay. Uh, another question was, what are some berry options that you can put in your yard? Oh, there's so many. Um, any of the, uh, so choke cherry, um, any of the dogwoods and the viburnums are both good families of plants that you can add to your list. Um, prunus, which is the cherry. Um, I think Service. those are your, are your heavy hitters. Service berries are really common great. I've heard of winter berries. Crab apples are pretty good. Um, yep. Your, your uh, juniper or your cedar trees, those are also really great. Also like Roseanne was saying is they're also providing shelter for birds in the winter time, but have those berries birds can eat in the winter and spring. Right. Winter berry is a beautiful one uh, for the foliage and the, the berries that it has in the fall. Um, all of the viburnums are fabulous and the dogwoods, yeah. So let's see, we had, Linda said, as far as the nesting material you can buy to plug the top holes, should you leave the material at the bottom as well? No, most of the time birds are looking to have some type of a, a natural, um, wood shaving in there or you can leave it just the way that it is and they'll be fine with with nothing in the bottom that you have to provide but if you do have the opportunity to put pine shavings in there it's good uh, kathleen said uh, thank you you're the best i learned some new tips <laughs> linda says where do morning doves sleep at night that would be evergreens as well good question Ooh. Yeah, Gary has at our Boyce Thompson Arboretum in Superior, Arizona, in the picnic area, there are a few cardinals that stay there during the hot summer. But on one or two of the cardinals, I see a crusting on one eye where they need to move their heads a different way to look around the crusting. Any idea what this is and why it happens? I believe that, I haven't heard about that in cardinals, but that would be conjunctivitis, I believe. And that would be a sign that feeders, if you're feeding, would need to be taken in, cleaned, and sanitized before you put them back out. Yeah, um, highly, highly communicable. And so uh, keeping feeders clean would be a great idea. Lucille said, uh, thanks for having us. Appreciate your time and effort. Be well and safe. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions that people have? Maybe you have recommendations that you want to also chime in with. Maybe there's a plant that we didn't mention that you found is really successful in your yard that you would love to share with people. Uh, Adele says, what are some recommendations for bird feeders? Oh boy. Um, there's so many. If you're looking at, uh, so I always try to look for something that's very easy for me and maintenance free. I like the seed cylinders because they last a long time. I can get them with seed that's made without shells. And so I don't have cleanup because anytime that you use something that has shells, you have to deal with the cleanup of the shells underneath, or that's a potential place that can become an area where birds can pick up germs that then create conjunctivitis and all types of other diseases. Um, so I, I like that type of feeding. I also am very much into squirrel proof feeders because of the fact that I have an oak 
tree. And so I have an abundance of squirrels. So I like the eliminator and the squirrel buster because they close with the weight of a bird and then you, or with the weight of a mammal, and then you don't have to deal with the mammals getting into those. You also don't have to worry about a baffle or specific placement because it's, it's uh, squirrel proof, mammal proof which to me is important. Um, I don't want to spend my money, much as I love squirrels, I don't want to spend my money feeding them. I think they have enough out there. I want to watch the birds. Yeah. yeah. And then mm -hmm. finch feeders, what I like about finch feeders is that I can shorten the perches down to five, about five eighths of an inch. And that allows me to feed all the finches without feeding the house sparrows. I live in an area where there's a lot of house sparrows and they would just sit there all day and eat. And so by the shortened perches, that allows me to be a little bit more specific in who I'm feeding. Yeah, and to kind of expand on that a little bit. Um, so you asked about the best feeders. So something that helps is each yard is gonna be a little bit different. The best thing I, I would probably recommend is going to your nearest Wild Birds Unlimited and explaining what type of yard you have, maybe placement um, and the, the workers that, work in those stores near you will probably be able to recommend based on your living situation what may be best for you um, in a more specific way. Very true because we have to ask ourselves how close is my feeder? Am I willing to shovel to get to it in the winter? Can I access it easily? You know a window feeder sounds like a great idea until you have to ask yourself can I actually get to that? Is there a path that I can get to? Um, are there trees that are someplace that I need to think about? Um, yeah, very good points, Brittany. We do need to think about what our yard is like and where are we sitting in our house so that we can look out? Sometimes our backyard isn't the best spot. My front yard has got much better windows so that I can sit and watch the birds. So I more of my feeders are in my front yard than my backyard. Yeah, yeah same minor in my front yard because I have slightly more open space in my front yard, but I have a lot of really old, like 80 foot tall trees in my backyard. So it'd be easier for squirrels to get to my feeders. There you go. So it's, yeah, it's all situation based, um, but yeah, there's definitely feeders you can recommend that are typically better, but yeah, that's, it's a not always a straight answer. Um, right. Anne says, is it okay to put feeders back up? She's concerned about avian flu and she hasn't heard much about it lately. Um, I think the reason we haven't heard much about it is because it has been pretty much restricted to uh, captive, captive birds. That's not the right word. So game birds. So if you've got chickens, if you're raising turkeys, guinea fowl, whatever you have going, that's the type of birds that see there that avian flu seems to be concentrated in. So if you're raising chickens, it would be very difficult to feed birds in the same space. I would stay away from that. Um, but feeding birds in your yard, as long as there isn't that uh, overlap between uh, captive birds or waterfowl, which has also been very much impacted, I think you're pretty safe in feeding the birds. Of course, keeping your feeders clean all the time is really of utmost importance. And that's whether avian flu is uh, on a rise or not. But with the cooler temps, avian flu is less transmittable. So I think we're pretty safe uh, as long as we're keeping our areas, our feeding areas clean. We're good to feed the birds. Wonderful. So Barbara says, any suggestions for ordinance officers that don't allow ground feeding or bury plants because they attract rats? He made me get rid of pokeweed because it is considered toxic. Robins love pokeweed. Oh, my, my sympathies for you, because I find it interesting that this is a, of concern for them, but then vegetable gardens are given a pass because it's the exact same thing. Anything that has fruit is something that is going to attract rodents, whether it's squirrels or rats or raccoons. Um, I guess if it was me, I would I would probably say, okay, I'll give a pass to the pokeweed if that's going to be something that they're going to really, you know, be 
be pointing out to you. And when it comes to ground feeding, maybe what I would think about would be a tray feeder that's on a pole system that has a baffle that would not allow anything to climb up there. Then that way you could prove to that officer that there's no way that any kind of mammal is going to be able to get up here. Squirrels can't get up here. Rats can't get up here. Raccoons can't get up here. And you could actually even take your pokeberry, cut the berries off and add it to there or add dried fruits to whatever seed that you're feeding and appease the officer as well as the neighbors so that you can still continue to enjoy the hobby and not rub anybody the wrong way. Something that you could even add, add into that whole system is um, I know you guys also sell really big tray feeders. You could also put that maybe right above the baffle and it catches any food that might get thrown on the ground and yes. reduce what ends on the ground. Yep, absolutely. And of course, that's where quality seed comes into play. If you go to, uh, I'll just say the grocery store, and you look at what they have in a bag and it says bird food, and you look at what the real contents are, there's a lot of times red millet in there, there's wheat, there's all kinds of other grains in there that aren't necessarily what birds are looking to eat. And that's what birds will be taking and you know, shoveling out of the way to get to the sunflower that they're looking for. When they're doing that, they're basically feeding the, un, the ones that you don't want, the, the undesirables underneath. So even though it may be that it seems it's more expensive to buy just straight sunflower um, or sunflower with maybe peanuts in it and a little bit of white millet, you're going to be without the waste that ends up on the ground that's attractive to those uh, mammals that you don't want. So that's an important thing to consider for sure. So Linda has, I recently purchased a high bush cranberry, which does not have berries right now since it's young. What birds will eat this berry once it does start producing? Oh, high bush cranberry. I've actually had cat bird in the springtime. My cardinals love it. Um, I'm trying to think of it. And I have had cedar wax wings visit it. So those are the three species that I've watched eat that in my backyard. Yep. Kathleen says, FYI, viewers may be interested in participating in Project Feeder Watch. This website has a lot of resources. Yes, it does. It's a great, it's a great effort for sure through Cornell. Thank you. Barbara asked, do you use any bird collision material on your windows to prevent collisions? Thank you, good oh, suggestions. Absolutely. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I could have expounded on that as part of, of what we can do to help birds in winter. Yes, I do. I have tried the stripes that I get through um, uh, Cornell, uh, no, the American Bird Conservatory. Uh, they sell those ABC. And so we have those in rolls and I've put them on all of my front windows. I have also tried the dots from Kaleidoscape and I have those on the back window of my house, just kind of as a test. Both have worked very well. The thing about protecting your windows is what we need to remember is that birds will fly through a space that is as small as two inches tall and four inches wide. So when you think about how small that really is, um, you need to do something that breaks up that pattern for them and it needs to be on the outside of windows. I know that there's an objection sometimes and I'm looking out through my front windows right now, there's an objection sometimes to, oh, well, this is in the way and I can't see as well. To me, if I went outside and found you know, a thrush or a kinglet or anything dead on the ground in front of my windows, that to me isn't, isn't worth uh, not doing that to my windows. Uh, birds don't know what glass is. We do. We know not to walk there. Um, but we create these habitats in the form of buildings that birds don't understand. And I really think it's our responsibility to make them as safe as possible for birds, especially during migration. April, May, you know, September, October. And uh, thank you for bringing up that topic because it is definitely a huge one for birds, for sure. 
Yeah, and I'll call it, I'll even expand on that a little bit because a lot of people they'll say, oh, the decal works, and the way it works is it's they see the one decal, they see all these little individual dots, but the issue is they still think they can fly through it. And that's why what Roseanne says with the two by four, or if you wanna include hummingbirds, the two by two inch space is also even better um, just because a lot of people have had uh, hummingbirds hit windows as well. And so that also helps is just because imagine a hawk flying through the forest and they turn sideways to get through the trees. It's kind of like that where they see this open area between the dots or between the decals where, yeah, you put maybe four or five and you think that's enough because it shows where the glass is, but um, it's those open areas that they still think they can get through and that's the problem. Right. Um, so Adele has, what is quality seed? What kinds of seeds does it have in it? Quality to me would be predominantly sunflower, whether it's in the shell or out of the shell. Some people prefer to go to safflower because uh, it's not as attractive to blackbirds. Um, some people think that safflower is less attractive to house sparrows as well. Um, I, I haven't found that to be true in my yard, but it does work for some people. I would definitely always uh, do something when it comes to peanuts. And in, in my case, I like out of the shell as well, because I don't want cleanup. I don't have enough time for that in my life, or I don't prefer to spend my time that way, I should say. And then when it comes to the, the sparrows, I like the white proso millet because that is definitely attractive to them. So I literally take a small amount and I put it just in front of where I have my leaf litter in my yard and then they can feed on that and then kick through the leaf litter. So if I had to, to limit myself to anything, it would be sunflower, peanuts, and white proso millet. Those would be my top three that I would offer in my yard. Of course, you could expand on that by doing more types of nuts and you could put uh, fruit in, you know, dried fruit in a blend and that would be good as well. Yeah, I would say, because I know what I always buy when I go to my stores is my favorite blend is the No Mess Plus blend. And it's um, one reason it's probably my favorite is it's com combining all of those great items, the dried fruit, but also the bark butter bits, which are oh, a fan yes. favorite of your woodpeckers and your other birds, because they're basically a little circular millet or uh, suet in your mix, which is cool. It is. It is. And then that way, if you offer that, you don't necessarily have to have a separate suet feeder. For some people, they don't have as many spaces that they can put, um, you know, different types of feeders. And so if you do the No Mess Plus, that is a good way to accomplish it all, for sure. Yeah. So Adele also says white millet, question mark, can you spell what you were just saying? Oh, white proso, P-R-O-S-O, -O, millet as opposed to red millet is not a real desirable other than I think in the Southwestern United States, there's some uh, quail that like red millet. All right, any other questions? If not, uh, that, we are at one o'clock. That's been about an hour. So uh, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you, Roseanne. We are really glad thank to you join so us. much. And uh, yeah, all in all, um, if you want this record, this will be recorded. So you can always go back and watch it. We'll, we'll be added to the Detroit Audubon website here sometime in the next week. Um, it will also be emailed to everyone that registered ahead of time. And if you want to learn about any of this, as well as much more, you're always welcome to go to your local Wild Birds Unlimited. Thank you so much, everybody, for attending. We appreciate you. Thanks, everybody.